Well, welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, today, you could stand on the camera here too. This is Roy uh, Lippman. I've had the pleasure of getting to know over the past several years um, and his work, my work on graph plots and his work on Redis graph. And so we've, we've linked up over that uh, and done some very fun things together. So uh, Roy is the author, the creator of Redis graph, the graph uh, database management system as part of Redis. And so today he's going to talk about Redis Graph and how it works and, and how it uses what kind of graph algorithms it can support inside. And he's uh, based in Tel Aviv Redis, with Redis there. Redis also has offices in uh, one in Austin and also in uh, San, Sunnyvale. San, Sunnyvale, Sunnyvale in the right. Bay Area, California. So, um, what else? Well, with that, thank you. This is yeah, welcome, Roy. Great to have you. It's great to be here. I appreciate uh, you all taking the time to attend. Let me just uh, show my screen and um, just to make sure, yeah, we're we're good to go. So I'm gonna show my screen. Okay. So once again, um, I appreciate the opportunity to be speaking to you today. Um, in this presentation, I would like to go over about how Redis Graph came to be. Redis Graph is a property graph database, an in-memory one, and how uh, the usage of Graph Plus um, had enabled us to, to achieve really great performance for this graph database. And so just to give some introduction and uh, an understanding about the type of graphs that we're managing within Redis Graph. So there are a number of different graph modules um, that, that you can be working with. Redis Graph specifically targets the uh, property, property graph model, which is an extension to the classical graph. Uh, and the extension gives you the ability to label nodes. So for example, here's a node that is associated with the user label. In addition, um, nodes and edges can be associated with attribute sets. So you can think about this as additional metadata on top of uh, the graph entities. So this user has an attribute set with three fields, date of birth, gender, and email. Um, so nodes and edges. Edges can be associated with a relationship type, um, and edges can also have attribute set attached to them. So here is a simple graph where we have one user node, which is connected with a bordered uh, edge to a flight node. So just to recap, uh, in the property graph model, we have nodes, edges, labels, relationship types, and attributes. And this model gives you enough flexibility to represent your data from a, a lot of different domains into, into a graph. And so using this, this data model, uh, we can see property graphs show up in all sorts of different use cases. Um, the most natural one to think about is obviously social networks, but we also see those graphs pop up in use cases such as access management and configuration control, network analysis, fraud detection, and now with the upcoming uh, graph neural networks where someone might use these to do either label or edge prediction, for example, to try and categorize a new node that has been introduced, what would be the label that is associated with it. Or you can even try and classify an entire graph under a number of different categories. Right, so <clears throat> how would one go about representing a graph in a computer system? Um, there is plenty of information about that in textbooks. Uh, there are a number of different ways to go about representing a graph. Uh, the way that Redis Graph does this is with what is known as an adjacency matrix. So it's basically 
a matrix that captures the graph topology. So to represent a, a graph with n nodes in it, we would use an n by n matrix. And the matrix would have uh, the value one in it at position row i column j if a node associated with the i id is connected to another node which has the id j. Um, that way, we can use this matrix to represent a directed graph, meaning that the edges have a, direct, a direction to them. And just once again, the rows of the matrix, these represent the source nodes, and the columns of the matrix, these represent the uh, destination nodes. So here's uh, the same example just highlighted for uh, node with ID zero, which is mapped to uh, row zero and column zero. The row itself captures the outgoing edges. So node zero is connected with an edge to node one and two, and we can see the relevant entries are set in there. And the incoming edges, in this case, node two is connected to node zero. We can see that the information captured on column zero. All right, so if we wanted to take this idea of an adjacency matrix and implement it uh, for a relatively small graph, a graph with only 1 million nodes, we would need a 1 million by 1 million matrix. Now, uh, let's assume that we would need just one byte for each entry of the matrix. Uh, if we do the computation quickly, we understand that we will need roughly about one terabyte worth of space in order to represent that graph, which makes this entire idea impractical. Luckily for us, most of the graphs that we're dealing with, uh, the type of graph that are naturally uh, created, um, all of those graphs has a, has a sparse pattern. Most of the entries in the matrix um, would be either zero or represent a non-connection. And so what we can do is we can use sparse matrices that exploit that pattern, and these only track the active entries. So for example, here's a sparse matrix, and if you were to ask what's the value in the matrix at row one, column one, uh, the answer would be the entry does not exist. I cannot tell you what the value is because uh, uh, simply the entry does not exist. And so if we were to take a similar graph <clears throat> with 1 million edges uh, and uh, 1 million nodes, the memory requirement would be around uh, 90 megabytes, which all of a sudden makes this entire idea to be extremely practical. And so if, if one wanted to work with adjacency, sparse adjacency matrices, uh, it would need some sort of a software library uh, that would provide you with uh, both sparse matrices and vectors, but you would all, also need um, linear operations on those, on those uh, uh, constructs. And this is, this is where Graphless comes in. So I was lucky enough, my, my timing was just right, uh, when I wanted to take Redis Graph, which was about one year in development and transition it to use sparse matrices, I've stumbled upon Graphless, which for me was, was a missing piece because when, all of the time that I was looking for sparse matrix uh, math library, um, I couldn't find any. Uh, the blast that we have, V1, V2, V3, uh, is dealing with dense matrices and dense vectors. And so I found out about uh, GraphPlus and Tim Davis work on, on sweet sparse GraphPlus. And from our five, six years experience with it, we found it to be extremely highly performant. The, the, the documentation is, is, is incredible. And the, uh, the list of functionality is very comprehensive you can really achieve a lot with, with the API. And so what, 
Redis graph is, it is an in-memory uh, property graph database. It uses graph plus in order to represent and operate on those sparse matrices. And it supports the cipher query language. So whenever you want to interact and send queries to the database, you would formulate those queries uh, using the cipher query language, which is uh, one of the more popular query languages for graph databases out there. And so if you look at a graph within Redis graph, you would see that it is represented uh, via three different types of matrices. Um, and we're dealing here, with, let's say, with, uh, with an uh, N nodes graph. So the first matrix, we call it the adjacency matrix. It captures the graph topology and it is um, relationship agnostic. We don't care about the type of edge. We just want to know if node I is connected to node J and that's captured by the adjacency matrix. In addition, each label in the graph is represented by a single label matrix and, and we can have as many as we wanted of those. The label matrix could have been a vector because it is a diagonal matrix. So for example, for uh, label I, it could be a user. If node K is associated with the user label, then you would find this matrix um, have an entry at position uh, K, K, so only on the diagonal. Lastly, for each relationship type, we have a relationship, corresponding relationship uh, matrix. This uh, is not necessarily diagonal, um, and it has a value at position IJ if node I is connected with relationship K to node J. So let's, let's look at uh, a demo graph here, for example. The, the graph that we will be working with has three different types of labels. We have users, companies, and universities. And the type of relationship that we uh, work with is uh, a user can be a friend of another user, a user can work at a company, and the user can graduate from some universities. And we have a bunch of different attributes associated with those nodes. Uh, and so going back to the re inner representation, we see that uh, these are the type of matrices that Redis graph would maintain. All right, talking a little bit about queries. I'm not going to go into details about the query language. We're gonna mostly focus about the pattern that the user can provide in order to query the database. So this is the first query that we will analyze. It uh, tries to get suggestions uh, uh, for for friendships, so similar. Yeah, go ahead. You. So I'm just is this like a graph SQL uh, format, or is something you designed yourself? Um, so this is a cipher query. Uh, the cipher query language was designed by Neo4j uh, a few years ago. They open source the language. Uh, the open source version of it is called OpenCipher. Uh, there are a number of different graph database providers such as Neo, Redis Graph, I believe MemGraph, and Neptune, they all support Cypher. And um, there is a push currently going on to standardize the query language for graph databases, something similar to SQL for relationship databases, um, but only for, for our industry. And that effort is called GQL. It is currently a standard, an ISO standard in, in the making. So hopefully within the next few, few years, the entire industry would align and we would have one formal query language because, yeah, so this is Cypher. Um, so the query here is trying to provide us with friendship, friendship suggestions. It searches for, in this example, for any user who, who are his friends, and then it, it uh, does a second hop to find friends of a friend. And we want to suggest friends of a friend who are not particularly you know, the user friends. And uh, there is high connectability between uh, the user node and the FOF node. 
So there's a good chances that that suggestion is within the, 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 the friendship boundaries of that user. So this is the pattern. This is what we will be focusing on. Um, we want to go from a user hop through a friend edge to some anonymous node, and then we, we do a second hop to the uh, friend of a friend node. And so what Redis Graph would do is that it would take this pattern and it would create a number of graph plus operations using the right operands in order to perform uh, the actual traversal. The actual traversal is done uh, via matrix matrix multiplication. And so what we need here, looking at this pattern, we need to use the user matrix, multiply that by the friend matrix once, and then we need to multiply that again with the friend relationship matrix. The user matrix here is once again a diagonal matrix. It is used as a permutation matrix to pick up the right rows from the friend uh, matrix. And the operation that we will be using is GRB MXM that does matrix matrix multiplication. So we start out with user times friend. We call that intermediate result friend hat. So this is friend hat. It just picked a number of rows from the uh, first friend matrix. And then we want to proceed with the second hop. So let, let's assume that this is the friend uh, relationship graph. So user zero is a friend of user four, user four is a friend of user one, and user one is a friend of user zero. What we want to get is this. This is the connection. This is the two hop connections. We know that if we traverse the graph twice from node zero, we would end up at user one and so on and so forth. And this is what we are, ex are expecting once we uh, perform the matrix multiplication. So doing the, the last multiplication, we're getting the FOF matrix. And indeed, the matrix captures the pattern that uh, we, we wanted to get. So for example, for row zero, uh, user zero, we can see that it is connected via two hops to user number one. The matrix tells us that. All right, so if we, if we recall, we wanted, if I go back all the way back to the uh, query, we wanted to get a, a, a group of suggestions. We wanted to count how many uh, um, ways there are for a particular user to get to some FOF. And then this is an aggregation step used by the, the count here. So we have those friends of friends ranked by, by the number of, of uh, common friends. So we sort that out and we just want five. We want the top five uh, friends of friends. These would be our suggestions. And so let's say that this is the matrix we ended up with. At this point, Redis Graph would uh, stop using Graph Plus. It would perform the aggregation on its own. It would perform the sorting on its own and it would also apply the limits on its own. But we can actually go further with graph plus. We can get the end result solely by using graph plus operations. So what we, we need to do now would be to sort, and we can use that with the GXB matrix sort, which would sort each individual row of the matrix. It would give us two uh, matrices. One is the sorted one known as C, and the second matrix, which is the uh, permutation matrix, which maps from C to uh, the sorted matrix uh, FOF. So for example, uh, for row zero, uh, nine is the highest value. So you, you would see it at the first column at matrix C and, and P will tell you what was the original position of nine in FOF. And so after we have sorted, let's say that we only care for, we only care for the, the, the top two uh, values, then we can use GRB matrix select to maintain only the first two columns. And this is, and this is the end result. This is, this is the result that the query asked for, solely using uh, graph plus operations. So let's do 
just another one query to see other Rukav plus operation. This one is asking a user who had graduated from a recently established university, where are they at today? They might have graduated from other universities or they might be working at some companies. So once again, we will focus solely on the pattern. So this is the pattern that we're interested in. Um, where I'm going left to right. So we start out from a university, we found out which users have graduated, graduated from it, and then we want to know where are those users at today. So this is node <clears throat> alias as T. And this is the set of operations that Redis Cup would produce for this pattern. So we start out once again left to right. We saw that a university label matrix multiplied by the graduated relationship matrix, but this time we need to transpose it because we want to go in a reverse direction. So if we transpose the matrix, we, we, we uh, change the direction of the edges instead of going um, from user to, so instead of going from university, so from user to university, we're going from university to user. And then we follow up with a, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, so I think this is the part actually really, uh, I think it's really interesting, but I think that's the part that really gets me confused is to map the query to all these matrix operations. Is there the best practice guide for you to figure out you know, how, you know, what's the, what's the uh, formula for you to do, go from the, uh, the queries to these? Yeah, so there's a, uh, there's a, um, a big set of logic within Redis Graph that determines where it should start traversing from. Because we can start traversing here from any node in this pattern. We can say, we want to start traversing from the user node and going uh, from user to T. And then we can, for, for those users that manage to get to T, it's a, it's a subsection of users, then we can traverse from those from that subsection to, to universities. It depends on filtering. So we want to start out with the smallest subset of entry point nodes uh, in order to keep the amount of data that we're processing to a minimum. We take into consideration if we have filters, if we have indices, we should take into account also the, the size and density of the matrices. So, uh, this part is this part of project is part of the uh, of the execution plan planner or the execution plan construction, which tries to minimize the number of records or number of data that we'll be uh, looking into. Um, yeah, because there is a lot of freedom here. Um, so this this is this is the the set of matrices and the set of operations that we need to evaluate in order to get. Uh, the end result. And so um, we need to take into account that Redis Graph, whenever, whenever we're doing traversal, the traversal is done in, in batches. So you can think about those batches as multi-source BFS. Um, if we choose to start with the university node, then we will um, chew through it in batches of 16. So each time we're looking at 16 different universities. And so we want to avoid performing operations on large matrices. So what we will do here is that we will first perform um, university times graduated transpose times users because the dimensionality would be 16 by N and not N by N, which might take a while. So the reduction in dimensionality speeds up the, the processing. All right, so we have, the, we have this 16 by n intermediate matrix. Now we need to multiply it by the, uh, the addition of works at and graduate. And this is because the edge that we're traversing from user to T can, the user specify that he wants to take into consideration both relationship types. And so we're not adding those matrices together because once again, this is an n by n uh, operation, which is costly. What we do is we multiply that 16 by n times 
n by n, and then we add that to the second multiplication, keeping the dimensionality to, to a minimum, and that really speeds up things. It, it, it also depends on, on the pattern and how many entries are active, but usually this, this works good for us. And so just to summarize, what Redis graph does is it takes um, graph queries written in Cypher, it produces a set of graph plus operations, which it evaluates. Uh, it might have done some additional processing on those uh, result matrices, but usually this is, this is getting close to the actual result set for answering the query. So this is, this is the general process that we go through. Um, one thing to notice is that usually those type of uh, graph systems they're dealing with dynamic graphs. The graphs usually are not necessarily static, meaning that over time, uh, there are some changes to the graph. It's either user updates some attributes or nodes are being added or deleted and, and edges are being uh, introduced or, or removed. So whenever an edge is removed, this is a simple operation we just remove the uh, relevant entry from the matrix. Um, we can do that with GRB matrix. Oh, sorry, this is addi addition, adding a, new, uh, adding a new edge. So this is just setting an entry in the matrix. This is, uh, this is pretty simple, straightforward. Deleting an edge simply removes that entry from the matrix. Now, no deletion, so if we want to delete node uh, zero here, this one would have to clear the relevant rows and columns. So row zero would be cleared and column zero would be clear. And we're using a free list to reuse deleted IDs. So the next time a node would be introduced, we would reuse, we, we will look into the free list seeing if there's something that we can uh, reuse and, and, and the, the ID would be once again associated with, with the node. And here the node was added and also some, some edges were added as well. If the free list is empty, we don't have a chance. We're gonna have to resize our matrix, making sure that there's enough room, there's a new road and there's another column attached uh, to the matrix. And this can be done with the GLB matrix resize function. So this is, this is the general uh, um, situation that we're dealing with here. We have a database and we have multiple clients that are uh, constantly sending uh, reads and write queries. So they're either inspecting the matrix, asking some information out of it, or they're modifying uh, the matrix. And um, modifying sparse matrices and uh, reading them often. So it's, it's a write, read, write, read, write, read kind of uh, pattern. This kind of pattern can be costly. And uh, here we can see a graph uh, showing you how much time would it take for a change to be fully committed because graph plus tries to take advantage of changes in such a way that you're asking for a change and graph plus would perform the change in a lazy way. It will tell you, yeah, I've acknowledged your request. Uh, I, I might have committed it, I might have not. Um, so it tries to accumulate changes uh, before it has no other choice but to actually commit those and set those changes in the matrix. Um, so here we're seeing that as the matrix grows in size and the number of entries uh, is getting bigger, the time to commit a single change increases. And this, and this can be a bit problematic for real-time systems. You don't want the time to perform a kind of a primitive operation. You don't want the time to scale with the size of the graph that you are working with. So, so we, we tackle that and we will see how we, we uh, um, address this issue. 
But to understand why is it, we need to look into the actual data structure. So how does a sparse matrix in, in Redis graph or how is the CSR format, uh, how is it constructed and, and what are the implications? So representing a sparse matrix using the CSR format, we, we would have an hierarchy of three arrays. The top level array captures, um, sorry, has an entry for each row in the matrix. So for an N by N matrix, we have an N plus one array. So each entry in the array is corresponding to the relevant row in the matrix. And the value there tells us um, what is the offset to the second array, which we'll see shortly. Um, what, what is the offset when we're trying to, for example, um, uh, query for, for a particular entry. Um, also, you can take two following entries, uh, subtract their values, and that will tell you how many active columns are there for that particular row. So this is the, the second array. Uh, I call it the column array. I'm not sure if that's the official name of it. It has n vowels, so the number of entries in that array is the same as the number of active entries in the matrix. And this one captures the column IDs, the active columns IDs. And lastly, another array, this one we, we refer to as the values array, and it has also n vowels entries in it. So for example, if someone uses the CSR format and it, it asks what is the value at position two one, the process is to first go into position two in the row array, we have a value three there. So that's the offset into the second array. We know that there are three entries there uh, because six minus three is three. So this, this is the area that we will be inspecting and searching for column number one. That part might be sorted, might not be sorted. And so we're starting to search for uh, the value one, we found it. And now there's a one-to-one -one correspondence or mapping between the column and the values array. And so we get six. And indeed position two one has the value six in it. And now what happens when we want to modify the matrix when we want to, let's say, um, uh, set, add, sorry, add a new edge. So it's, there's a lot of work to be done now. Uh, we need to, um, update the row array. We need to uh, adjust accordingly because we have one additional new value that has been added. So we need from, from the point of entry all the way to the end, we need to increase those entries by one. That might be a lot of work to do. We need to resize the columns array and then shift uh, the entries accordingly. And the same thing needs to be done for the values array. This is, this is expensive. We don't want to do this often, and, and we see why this is uh, expensive as the graph is getting, or the matrices are getting bigger. So the way that Redis graph uh, tries to uh, address this issue is by taking uh, any matrix and it represented by using three different matrices. So for example, A, that's the matrix that we want to represent. We're using this concept we, we refer to as a delta matrix. So A is represented by three different matrices. The first one is an N by N uh, CSR, mostly static matrix. It captures around 98, 99, sorry, 95 to 98% of the original matrix A. So it's extremely similar, extremely close to A. Then we have two additional matrices. So we have delta plus, which captures only recently added values. It's an N by N hypersparse matrix. And we have its counterpart, which uh, we refer to as delta minus. This one captures only the deletions of entries. And we set up a threshold for how many changes we're willing to accumulate before we're flushing delta minus and delta plus into, into M, because we don't want this delta plus and delta minus to, to continue on growing forever. So there's a, there's a limit. I think that the, the threshold currently stands on about uh, 5K. So it's a, it's a rough number. So let's see how that, how that would work. 
So let's say that we wanted to set uh, matrix A at position two, two to the value three. The first thing that we do, we, we, we check if two, two is already present in M. If that's the case, updating an existing value is cheap and we will do that. Otherwise, if it's missing, we would add that to delta plus. So this one is getting added to delta plus. Uh, setting A position row zero column three, that one already exists. This is a cheap operation. So we apply it directly into M. Uh, let's add just another one. So adding a value to one three, uh, this one gets added to delta plus. And now we're removing an entry. So we want to remove entry at position three, three. Um, we notice that that value does not exist in delta plus because if it does, we would have removed it directly from delta plus. In this, in this case, it does not. So we mark the deletion at delta minus, say, saying that position is marked for deletion. Um, deleting row one, column two, this one exists in delta plus, so we just remove it directly from, from delta plus. The intersection between delta plus and delta minus is an empty set. So this is why we need to check each time uh, whether or not entries exist in, in either one. And so if we wanted to construct A from this triplet, the way to do that is would, to, would be to take M, remove all of the recently deleted entries, and add all of the recently added entries. And we do that by applying a complemented mask. This, this is delta minus complemented into uh, on to M and adding delta plus to it. So the complement basically just reverse uh, existing entries are marked as non-existing and uh, non-existing are, are, are now existing. And so we've, we've marked uh, uh, entry three, three, as deleted, so the, this is the complemented. Um, and what if we apply it as a mask, we will see that this two at the bottom right simply disappears. So this is M after applying uh, after applying the mask. Uh, this the, the two here got removed, and then we simply add delta plus to get the new uh, the new A value. So this is how we commit all of the changes back to into M. And this is, and this is the result in time, in terms of uh, uh, flush time or commit time, it made a huge difference for us. Um, all right. So Redis Graph and, and Graph Plus has, Redis Graph has been in the working for uh, almost six years now. Um, it is currently being used by a number of uh, known companies, Apple, Verifon, IBM. Uh, it is open source, um, starting to, to, to be popular. Uh, we have over um, almost uh, 2000 GitHub stars, and I think we're almost at 2 million Docker pools. Um, what's next? What is, um, can you go back? So, so I knew about some of them, but not all of them. So what is FedEx? Can you say anything about, say what FedEx is using for? I know that FedEx is using Graph Plus in order to investigate different routes um, uh, in, in which they, they might consider sending packages. So they have different facilities and packages can go from a specific, from, from some facilities to some other facilities and they, they want to inspect which is the best route for any package to be delivered. Go ahead, yeah. Also for the, uh, on the rating side, how many developers are coming? I know you are probably the leading developer as well. Right. Um, so the team had grown and shrunk over the years. Uh, currently, we have two developers, myself and uh, Avi Avni, which is which is on the call. Um, we're hiring. That that would be my last slide. Um, yeah, we're always looking for people who are interested in this field and, and want to, to participate and, and contribute. So we, we are hiring, we're trying to grow. Right. Um, so what's next? Uh, for us, we, we 
this field of graph databases, and I think that graph, graph databases uh, in general is very competitive. And there's a, there's a lot of focus on performance, both throughput and latency. We always want to, to be faster. And so I believe that these three bullet points are um, three areas that we want to focus on that would yield a significant increase in performance. One, we want to JIT our execution plans. We want to turn Redis Graph into a multi-version concurrency control system, which would give us uh, a better throughput. And we're looking forward to Tim's work with NVIDIA on running uh, Graph Plus on the GPU. So three very exciting areas, uh, in my opinion. So with that, I, I really want to thank you for attending. And as I said before, if you're interested in, in this field, uh, we are hiring. So uh, feel free to contact me. And once again, uh, thank you. Um, if, if we have any questions, I'll be happy to, to take them. Thank you. <laughs> Sure, tell the Zoom folks too. Yeah, let me stop sharing. Let's see if we have any questions on Zoom. Oh, well, maybe I should continue on sharing. Um, I don't see if 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 you have any any questions, feel free to send them out on the chat. Yeah, go ahead. Um, when you talk about hiring, uh, can you be more specific? Um, uh, what is it that you look for? Scholarships, opportunities for students that might be interested in. So, in a way, the end goal for that will be to create a platform on our website where folks like you can go in and submit your, like, your opportunities. Mm -hmm. And we'll eventually post, and the students will have access to that by contacting the director of the process of full contact. So, my question to you is what are you looking for? Or if you can provide more of those details to us. So we can advertise that among the students that we mentioned, so they're coming up with the potential, and we also have access to all the students on campus. Okay. Um, so th first of all, thank you for that. Um, I think that. Oh, Roy, why don't you repeat briefly the yeah. questions for the oh. for the recording and for the people who <laughs> Zoom? Yeah. Okay. Basically, what kind of skills you mentioned? Yes. So, so the question was. Um, what, uh, yeah, what type of skill sets would be relevant for someone who, who wants to be involved in, in, in Redis Graph or, yeah, in, the, in this particular project? So I think that someone who is interested in performance-oriented type of programming, this is, this is one thing because a lot of the work needs to take into account or, or you know, the, the, the uh, thought process should uh, uh, focus on the performance implications of, of one implementation or the other, both in terms of um, runtime, but also in terms of um, memory consumption. So we want, we want to maximize uh, both. So performance oriented, uh, the project entirely is written in C in order to once again try and squeeze the most that we can from, from the hardware. So some knowledge of uh, C programming. And then it would be great if uh, there is some background in either graph theory, uh, you know, knowing what a graph is and, and uh, maybe uh, being familiar with a number of graph algorithms. Uh, it would be fantastic if uh, that person would be interested in, in uh, it, you know, in the field of some some uh, uh, applicable math, so some knowledge of uh, linear algebra, and uh, um, because Tim Davis is is here, so maybe 
some experience with with Kraft plus that well, that would be phenomenal but uh it you know it's hard for me to tell because um i i i'm not i'm not so sure i myself i don't have i don't have a degree i uh, been uh, in the industry, working in the industry for almost uh, 15, 16 years. I, so um, I, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure uh, what is the right so answer. I'll be happy to follow up with you. Okay. All right. This is something that we would, uh, but, have yeah, we, we would, we would love, we would love to, uh, to get some, some candidates. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, you were mentioning like how FedEx uses this for like finding out routing stuff like that. Uh, which I'm assuming. So, if they have something like a, min, a specialized min bus problem for their routing stuff, uh, which let's say doesn't exist in registrar uh, operations right now, can like a user defined functions be added? Like if you have some other analysis that's okay. Uh, so the question was uh, if there is a way to extend right the Redis graph in ways that you can introduce your own logic for I don't know maybe graph algorithms. Um, so I think that there are two ways to approach this. One, if you can formulate your algorithm purely in Cipher that would be the straightforward way. But most of the time that's, I don't know, I mean, Cypher is used for querying the data. Uh, it's not for running an actual algorithm. Um, for running an algorithm, because Redis Graph is written in C, it's pretty hard to let uh, the general public for that matter to easily extend it. Uh, there are a number of implications. First, the, 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 the Someone who wants to extend it needs to have deep understanding of the components inside uh, the database. And second, um, it's, it's C integration, which might not be so trivial. Um, we have been thinking for the past at least two years on, um, oh, I'm running low on battery. I hope that uh, we, can, we can manage till then. Um, We've been thinking about some kind like a graph API that you would get a, a set of APIs for um, getting information out of the graph and you can use that API to write your own logic. We're not, we're not there yet. I know that there are some other graph databases that for example are written in Java and they already have this type of graph API. So the integration and the extensibility is much more easier for us because we're C-based, it's, it's a bit more, challenging but uh, usually we take requests so uh, usually we either get them from our sales rep or on github and if the request is uh, legitimate and the, the request is, is, is general enough uh, we might we might implement it yeah. uh, so you said the work for spark graph Best. So, is there like a density limit? Like, there are density limits? No, we do not enforce. Oh, so the question was uh, Redis Graph is, is, is supposed to handle sparse graphs. What happens when, when the graph is, is becoming dense? Um, so, there's no limitation. If you want to create a dense graph, uh, Redis Graph will allow you. Expect uh, poor performance probably because the data types do not uh, are not so, um, are not fitted. I know maybe, maybe Tim can well, give some information we, because you have uh, different formats. Did, well, did that format. Like, right. So I, I had one format where I stored the graph, the matrix as uh, two matrices, one of values and then a full matrix, full array, and then say an N by N higher array. And another array of Boolean that tells me what's present and what's not. I still have to maintain the structure. I can't just put it as zero and there's no edge. Uh, so those are suitable for fairly dense, say more than 10% present 
that that's very suitable for that. But you just can't make a million by million. You can't make a graph of a million by million. Uh, I was trying to understand, like, like we usually if it is below 10%, then this would work best. I would just switch data for me. I don't know which, I mean, the bitmap format works very fast when the graph is fairly dense. So it's just a, it'll just be a big, big, big problem. That's what I'm saying. Okay, I think we have any other questions. So, I'm going to close today and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.